Um, so, uh, welcome everybody to the Turkish Math Society's Distinguished Colloquium Series. Um, today, we're very pleased to have Isabel Vogt from uh, Brown University, who will tell us about interpolation problems for curves. So, Isabel got her PhD in 2019 from MIT under Bjorn Punen and Joe Harris. She was an NSF postdoc at Stanford and then a faculty member at University of Washington before joining Brown University. She has a very long list uh, of awards and uh, honors, including a Barry Goldwater Scholarship, a Mariam Mirzakhani Fellowship. She was an NSF postdoc and she was an IESWM Charles and Lisa Simoni uh, ambassador. Uh, so we are very pleased uh, that she agreed to give um, our distinguished colloquium. So without further ado, I'll turn uh, it over to Isabel. Thank you. Thanks, Isette. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. So um, before I go on, uh, all original work I'm going to talk about uh, today is joint with Eric Larson, who you can see pictured here. And also, I'm very receptive to questions. Um, feel free to just shout them out. I won't be watching chat or seeing if you raise your hand or anything. So uh, please feel free to interrupt me and ask me a question at any point uh, if you want to. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about interpolation problems for curves. So what is the interpolation problem? So here is the interpolation problem in its most general form. Uh, suppose I fix some collection of N points in some space. We'll make this more precise later. When does there exist a curve of some given type? And it's going to be important uh, when we specify that type. So a curve of a given type through this collection of points. So I will give some examples, which will make more clear what I mean uh, when I say type. Um, but I've given the number of points a name, n, because based on what type of curve we're looking for, uh, this number, maximal number of points that we can pass the curve through will change. So we're paying attention to what this value of n is. So I also want to emphasize that this is exact interpolation. It's not something statistical. So here's a little picture, right? I actually want to find a curve that actually passes through all these points. It's not curve of best fit or anything like that. Okay, so let's do some examples. Um, and I know this is a little awkward on Zoom, so maybe I won't force audience participation, but uh, if, I, if I give you two points, uh, what types of curves can I pass through two points? Straight line. Yeah, a straight line, perfect. So, uh, so that's Euclid's first postulate, very old, uh, 300 BC. There's a line through any two points. So this type of curve, that's the line. And if I specify that type, then the maximum number of general points, points in general position that I can pass through is two. I can't pass through three general points with a line. Okay, so let's make it a little harder. Um, if I give you three points, what types of uh, curves can I pass through those three points? This is too advanced for me. <laughs> circle. You can pass a circle through those three points. This again goes back to Euclid, uh, 300 BC. Um, there's a circle through any three non-collinear points. So uh, I just want to emphasize this non-collinearity. That's the generality condition. I, if I were to pick, you know, a billion points that happen to already lie on a circle, then of course it would be a circle through them. But that would be rigging the problem. Like that, that's not a generic configuration of points. So if I pick a generic configuration of three points, then I can find a circle. And that's the type. So these are the flavor of problems we're going to be dealing with. We're going to generalize these things from classical antiquity. So the types of curves that we're going to be looking for, they're going to be algebraic. They're going to be generalizations of lines and circles and things like that. OK, so here are those two uh, results from classical antiquity that, that go back to uh, Euclid um, around 300 BC, a line through any two points, a circle through any three general points. And there's another result. Uh, from classical antiquity uh, due to Pappus. Um, and so a circle, you might remember, is, is a special type of conic section, the sort of curve you could get by taking a cone and slicing it with a plane. Um, but it's not a generic type of conic section. 
And so if you allow yourself a generic conic section, like a hyperbola or an ellipse, um, those can pass through five general points. Um, so this might not look so impressive with all of our modern technology, but uh, at the time, the way that Pappas proved this was synthetically constructing this conic section given five points. Um, and so when you think about it like that, it, it's very impressive. It's not obvious if you give me a collection of five general points, how do you actually construct that conic? How do you construct um, the foci of the ellipse or something out of those five points? Uh, so here's an animation you can find on Wikipedia that gives a more modern constructive proof. Um, it'll repeat so you can see it again. So these blue points, those are my five general points. And using sort of compass and straight edge technology lines through these points, I can trace out that red uh, conic through those points. Okay, so I just want to emphasize it's constructive, so it's kind of, it's pretty impressive. Um, but a big leap forward in this type of problem of understanding when I can interpolate certain uh, curves through points came with the birth of algebraic geometry, my field, in the 1700s. And the key insight here is that curves have equations. So all these sort of synthetic constructions where you have to use a compass and straight edge to, to trace out these things, um, uh, we can now just solve for these curves, solve for their equations. So, um, so let's reprove Pappas's result that if you give me five general points in the plane, I can always find a conic section through them. Let's reprove that using algebraic geometry. So um, I'm going to drop the section. It's just going to be called a conic. So a conic C, that's a curve. Um, and it's specified by an equation of degree two. So it's in the plane, in the xy plane. And I'll think about this curve as, um, as cut out by this equation, ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f equals zero. This is just the generic form of an equation of degree two in the plane. So every monomial has degree at most two. And specifying this A, B, C, D, E, F, that tells me what conic I have. So if I were to take A equals 1, B equals 0, C equals 1, D equals 0, E equals 0, and F equals minus 1, I'd get the unit circle. Um, and taking different values, I get different things. So you should think about this equation as a rule. It's a way of telling you if some point is on the curve. So if I have some random point, P, Q, in the X, Y plane, to figure out if it's on my conic, I just plug it into my equation and see if I get zero. So this is tailor-made for our problem of figuring out when curves pass through points, because if I want to figure out if five points are on a conic, I just have to figure out if the five equations that I get by plugging um, the x value in for x and the y value in for y are zero. So this might look kind of uh, this might look kind of intimidating. <laughs> There's a lot on the slide, um, but what you have to realize is that um, these p1, q1, p2, q2, all these things, these are just constants. These are just like real numbers. And what we're trying to look for is the conic. So we're trying to find a value of b, d, c, b, a, b, c, d, e, f. So if you think about it that way, um, did it progress to the next slide? I'm sorry, my Zoom is not showing me anything different. Is that, are you seeing the next slide? Yeah, we are yeah, seeing yeah, yeah. the next one. That's really weird. Um, okay, it just looks frozen to me. Okay, now I see it. Okay. It looks good for us. Uh, kind of one. disturbing. <laughs> now I see it. Um, so this conic is specified by an equation of degree two. So we're trying to find this A, B, C, D, E, F, the things that you should see in pink, I hope. Um, and if you think about those equations as solving for the things in pink, the A, B, C, D, E, F, it's now linear in those equations, in those coefficients, the things that we're trying to solve for. So um, you could rewrite this problem in the language of linear algebra. This A, B, C, D, E, F that we're trying to solve for is just a non-zero vector in the kernel of this matrix that I can write down from the points. And 
Okay, so why can I pass through five general points? The insight is that a matrix that has more columns than rows always has a non-zero kernel. There's always some non-zero A, B, C, D, E, F um, that when I multiply it by this matrix, I get zero. And if I want to have more columns than rows, the columns are indexed by the number of monomials in this equation. So there are six monomials and the rows, well, that's the number of points. So if I need to have more monomials than, than points, I can have at most five general points. So that reproves Pothesis theorem, but much easier just using the language of linear algebra. Okay, questions about that? Okay, so using that idea, uh, you could use linear algebra to reprove this this um, class this theorem from the 1700s of uh, Kramer. So um, so instead of so a conic was a plane curve, a curve in the x y plane of degree d. Uh, sorry, of degree two. So if we generalize that to degree D, so something whose equations, all the monomials have total degree D instead of two, a plane curve of degree D passes through D times D plus three over two general points. So D times D plus three over two, that's the number of, um, well, D times D plus three over two plus one is the number of monomials that show up. And the number of general points is one less than the number of monomials. So something even better is true. Um, these points, in fact, determine the curve. So there is a unique plane curve of degree D that passes through D times D plus three over two general points. So if you really honestly choose general points, there's a unique curve, which says that this kernel of that matrix that I wrote down is one dimensional. So um, all of the different A, B, C, D, E, F, blah, 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 all the way, all the monomials, um, it's unique up to common scaling, which specifies the same curve because it vanishes at the same points. So uh, Kramer is a name that's that's um, that's famous in linear algebra, right? Kramer's theorem, Kramer's rule, um, a way to uh, solve for the solutions of a system of linear equations. And so this is why he cared about solving for the solutions of a system of linear equations. He was trying to actually write down these curves that, that interpolate through points. So one more thing that came from the um, 1700s is the following uh, result of warring. So this is maybe the most famous interpolation problem. So there's a unique degree D polynomial in one variable, f of x, that takes specified value at d plus one distinct inputs, p1 through pd plus one. So it might take a second to think about why this is a version of the interpolation problem that I've told you, fix a general collection of points in some space, and then ask when is there um, a curve of a specified type passing through those points. Um, but here I'm still in the xy plane, and the type of curve is now the graph of a degree d polynomial. So that's the type that I'm going to look at. Okay, so um, so this Waring interpolation problem, 1779, published by Waring, it was rediscovered by Lagrange um, more than 15 years later. And uh, history remembers this as the Lagrange interpolation theorem, but uh, originally published by Waring. All right, so I wanna give an application of all of these things um, that uh, to the real world, a beautiful application of these ideas of interpolation from the 1700s. So, um, and, and that is uh, to digital storage media. So, um, a CD, right, that's some form of digital storage or a QR code. Um, so this is some way of storing information and then you want to read back that information at some point. And in that process of reading back that information, there might be some errors in transmission. And so you'd like to come up with some protocol for which you can detect when there are errors in transmission and correct them. And um, a protocol that, that is still used to this day um, is based on the interpolation problem. So I want to briefly go into that. So here's my very simplified system of what that looks like. So suppose you want to send n numbers, p1 through pn. So in a very simple sense, you're trying to maybe like read a CD and you're trying to read this information and that's sending these numbers p1 through pn. 
And we want to build in some redundancy in the system so that we can detect when there are errors in transmission of these numbers and also hopefully correct when there are errors in transmission. So, um, okay, again, this is kind of awkward on Zoom, so maybe I won't ask, but if someone wants to volunteer, what's like the most naive way that you could build in redundancy to know when there are errors in transmission of these numbers? Okay, awkward on Zoom. I'm not going to force it. Um, no, repeat them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can repeat them, exactly. So uh, does everyone see? This is really bad. Okay. Yeah, okay. So if you just want to detect when there are errors, just send exactly as you said, just repeat each one twice. Send the first number twice, send the second number twice, all the way through the nth number twice. Um, and then if there's an error, probably errors don't happen that frequently. So there's only one error in a given pair. And you can tell when there's an error because uh, the two numbers will be different. And using that same idea, you can also uh, correct when there are errors. So um, just send each number three times. <laughs> and then in each given pair, probably two of the numbers will be the same if there's an error and you'll know that that's the correct value. So these really naive answers, they do work, um, but they're very inefficient because you have to end up sending uh, twice as many numbers or three times as many numbers. So you only wanted to send n, but you have to send 2n or 3n. So very inefficient. And a much more efficient um, idea was, uh, was given by Reed and Solomon. This, their paper was published in 1960 um, called Polynomial Codes Over Certain Finite Fields. And these codes now are known as Reed-Solomon codes, and they're based on the interpolation problem. So uh, I just want to briefly describe that to you because I think it's really beautiful. So Reed-Solomon error correcting codes. So I use these numbers, P1 through Pn, to construct a polynomial. I use them as the coefficients of my polynomial. So my polynomial has degree n minus 1, 1 less than the number of, um, of numbers. So P1 times x to the n minus 1, dot, 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 all the way through Pn. So as we know from warring interpolation, the values of this polynomial at n distinct inputs, so like f of 1 through f of n, uniquely determine the polynomial. And if I have the polynomial, I know its coefficients p1 through pn. So if I want to send p1 through pn, I could equivalently send f of 1 through f of n. No different. Um, but the power comes when we want to detect or correct errors. So if you want to detect errors, so you just send one extra number, just over-determine your system. If there are no errors, then uh, it will be the same curve that, that passes through these n plus one uh, points, the same graph, same, n plus, same curve through the n plus one points, no problem, everything's good. But if there's an error in transmission, if one of these, um, one of these values changes, then there probably won't be a curve of degree n minus one, the graph of a function of degree n minus one that passes through them. And so you'll know that there's an error. But you won't be able to know what the right polynomial was because there will be multiple polynomials through all but one of the points. And so if you want to be able to correct your error, just send one, just send one extra point, and then you'll be able to figure out what the correct one is by simply um, finding the curve that the graph of the polynomial that has the plurality of the points. So you can see this one here has, has more points than the dotted one, so we know that that's the correct one. And the numbers that show up here, you only have to send one more um, number or two more numbers, so it's way more efficient than sending twice the number of numbers or three times the number of numbers. And this efficiency, this fact that you can use the interpolation problem to do this, um, is why it's still used to this day. So Reed Solomon codes underlie um, all digital storage media to this day. So one technical point is that uh, you don't want to be sending numbers that are astronomically larger than what you actually want. So in order for the values of the polynomial to not be astronomically larger than the coefficients, um, you actually have to work over finite fields. So that's why their paper was called Polynomial Codes Over Finite Fields. All right, any questions about the applications or 
or any of these ideas of, of interpolating uh, plane curves, curves in the xy plane using linear algebra. All right, so, um, so where do we go from here? I think there's, uh, so, you know, that was all the 1700s. How do we bring the interpolation problem into the modern day? And I think there's multiple different things you could think of. So uh, here's one thing, here's the most naive thing you could think of. Sorry. So you could try to interpolate um, what would be called a higher dimensional algebraic variety, but still uh, have it be specified by a single equation just in more variables. So remember we, we did a long uh, discussion of Pappas's theorem using linear algebra. So that was something a polynomial of degree two, but in two variables, X and Y. So I could still take a polynomial of degree two, but in three variables, X, Y, and Z. So here is such an example, I'm calling it Q. Um, so if you took the vanishing of this polynomial, the points in the X, Y, Z space, three-dimensional space, where this polynomial vanishes, you would get an object called a quadric surface. Uh, so, okay, another, potential audience participation point. Uh, can anyone figure out how many general points a quadric surface should interpolate? And maybe you saw because my slides are messed up. I mean, Zoom won't show me what you see. Um, yeah, so how many general points does a quadric surface interpolate through? Looks like eight. Uh, I, th I think you're just off by one. It's nine, but you're on the right track. Miscounted. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you must have just count miscounted because you got almost the right thing. So there are 10 coefficients. There should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 coefficients. And um, right, you can interpolate through a number of general points, which is one less than the number of coefficients. So this quadric surface uh, can interpolate through nine general points. All right. So um, Everyone should remember that quadric surfaces are going to come up again, and uh, I will ask again for audience participation uh, when they come up again. So remember that. Remember that number. Um, but was that very fun, right? Like we already knew in the 1700s, we knew how to use linear algebra to do these sort of things. Um, it's not. It's not really a new. It's not really a new thing. So so um, not that fun. So I want to. I want to go in a different direction. I want to. Um, so, so the direction I'm going to take this that we go into the modern era is that we're going to stick with curves, but we're going to allow more types of curves. So all of the problems so far have been fixing some general collection of points in the plane and asking for curves of certain types through those points. So I'm going to allow more types. So I'm going to work in an R dimensional space. So uh, technically this is projective space of dimension R. You don't need to uh, know what projective space is or it's not really essential. Just think about an R-dimensional space, like the complex numbers to the R or R to the R. Um, and so in the plane, there was this notion of the degree of the curve, which is you look at the defining equation and you take the maximum degree of a monomial that shows up there. So there's a notion of degree more generally in an R-dimensional space. So, uh, so here's what it is. So we're working in this R-dimensional space and you can take um, a subspace of this R-dimensional space of dimension one less. So an R minus one dimensional subspace. So the curve has dimension one, the subspace has dimension R minus one. You expect them, those two dimensions are complementary. You expect them to meet in finitely many points. And that is in fact true if you take a general um, subspace of dimension one less. So that finite set of points, that is what we call the degree of the curve. And the fact that this agrees with my previous notion of degree for curves in the xy plane is the fundamental theorem of, of algebra. So over the complex numbers, a polynomial of degree d has d roots counted with multiplicity. And so that is the, that is the generalization to an r-dimensional space. And there's one more invariant of these curves, which is the genus of the curve. So this is a topological invariant. So if you were to look at this curve over the complex numbers, 
So that's like the complex solutions to the polynomial equations that define this curve. Because the complex numbers are two dimensional over the real numbers, if we think about this in our real world, they are they look like surfaces. So these these algebraic curves, um, abstractly, they're just compact rebound surfaces. So um, they have some number of holes, and this topological invariant, the genus, is the number of holes. So if it looks like a sphere, it's genus zero. If it looks like a donut, it's genus one. And in general, you count the number of holes, and that's genus G. So going back here, so the curves, the types of curves that I'm going to allow are curves in an R-dimensional space of degree D and genus G. So here's the main question that I had, the very vague main question I had on the first slide. When does there exist a curve of some given type through these through n general points? So now I can make this more precise. When does there exist a curve of degree D and genus G in R dimensional space, PR, through a collection of n general points? And the thing that we need to understand in order to attack or think about this problem is what should n be? How large can we make the number of general points so that there is still a curve of degree D and genus G through them? So for instance, if we were working in the plane and we made the degree B one, that will turn out to make the genus B zero, those will be straight lines and N can be at most two. So how do we generalize that idea? So to do that, I wanna revisit Kramer's theorem, which if you recall, will say a degree D plane curve can interpolate through at most d times d plus three over two general points. And there's no genus in the picture here because in the plane, the genus, if I have one of these, a general degree d plane curve, the genus is specified by the degree. So I don't have to include it. Okay, so how did we get this number d times d plus three over two? Well, we use the equation of the curve. So d times d plus three over two, um, that was one less than the number of coefficients in the defining equation. And so uh, because a plane curve of degree D is just specified by its equation, considering all the parameter space of all possible degree D plane curves, all I need to tell you is what the coefficients of the defining equation are up to common scaling. Because if I scale all the coefficients by a non-zero number, it vanishes at the same points. So that subtracts off that one, the common scaling. So this D times D plus three over two, it's the dimension of the parameter space of degree D plane curves. And then it was one condition for a plane curve to pass through a specified point, which you know you should think about, okay, so we derived that and we wrote down the equations to pass through a point. You just plug in the coordinates into the equation, but you should have a more intuitive sense of this, right? I have the plane, it's a two-dimensional object. I wanna hit some point. If I just have one curve, probably it's not gonna hit that general point. But if I have a one dimensional family of those curves, as they vary, they will sweep out the entire plane and they'll hit that point. So I need a one dimensional family to guarantee it to pass through a point. So we can generalize, we can generalize that to our dimensional space. So uh, this insight too generalizes to an expectation based on that intuitive thing I just told you. So if I have a point in an R dimensional space, a single curve probably won't pass that point. A one dimensional family of curves, if R is greater than two, also probably won't pass to that point. But if I have an R minus one dimensional family of curves, then as I take that whole family, it should sweep out every point in my R dimensional space because the curve is one dimensional and I have an R minus one dimensional family. So it will hit that one point. So that's saying it should be R minus one conditions for a curve to pass through a point. But the difficulty in actually proving this or using this to get an, uh, an understanding of what n should be is that a curve in R dimensional space is usually not specified by R minus one equations. So all of these techniques that we had um, in the plane um, uh, will, not, will not prove the answer and they won't even immediately tell us what the answer should be. We can't use the equations. Um, nevertheless, we get out of this an expectation, a conjecture, just like the most naive conjecture you would get from this idea of a point and I need a family of curves to pass through this. So the maximum number of general points through which a curve of degree D and genus G in R dimensional space can interpolate should be the dimension of the parameter space of these, of these curves 
over r minus one, the number of conditions. Does this expectation make some intuitive sense to everyone? All right. Um, great. So there is a nice parameter space. So I'm going to call this space MGPRD. Uh, that's just that, those are just uh, symbols at this point. But maps from a curve of genus G. That's the G down here um, to our dimensional space PR, where the image has degree D. So that's that's just what I mean by this. That's my parameter space. So um, if I want to turn this expectation into an actual you know, conjecture, I need to understand what the dimension of this parameter space is. All right. So, um, okay, does everyone know what this symbol means or conveys? Okay, this is, <laughs> this, is a road, this is a road sign. And what it's supposed to convey to you is danger, <laughs> you know, danger, warning, bad things could happen. Um, but also it, it literally reads out to curves ahead, which I like because there are more curves ahead. So um, curves, more curves are coming. So, but this is danger. So why is this danger? Um, well, this space that I just uh, wrote down for you, this parameter space for uh, genus G degree D curves in PR, it can have multiple components. So um, that means that this, these, these types that I wrote down, this was not really a good definition of type. Because if I have like multiple different components, then specifying the degree and the genus and the dimension of the projective space doesn't, you know, they're not all deformation equivalent. I can't, you know, you know, move from one to the other in this parameter space. Um, I really haven't given you a good notion of type. And furthermore, these components can be of different dimensions. So in that expectation, I told you we needed to take the dimension of this space and divide it by r minus one, and that would tell us what the number of general points should be. Well, if they're different dimensions, then that's, uh, you know, the number, the expectation could be different on different components. So that's worrying. And also this space can, can have arbitrarily bad local structure, it can just be a, a really bad parameter space. And there's actually a theorem that that's true. So, um, so it's looking pretty bad. It's looking that this, you know, naive way of, getting the number based on our intuition from plane curves and Kramer's theorem uh, is, is not very um, useful, but, um, but there's a fix. So, uh, and the subject is called brill noether theory. And this is something that was developed, uh, well, so Brill and Noether very classically conjectured uh, the answer to this. And then uh, it, it wasn't proved until the 1980s in the combined effort of, of many mathematicians. Um, developing our understanding of, of linear series on curves. So uh, Griffiths, Harris, Giesecker, Fulton, Lazarsfeld, Eisenbud, and others. And so what the brill noether theorem is going to do is it's going to pick out a component from this wild zoo of possible components. It will pick out one component on which we know its dimension and everything is well behaved. So here is the, here's the theorem. So when this quantity rho of GRD, so this is just a number that I can cook up from these invariants, the genus, the dimension of the space, and the degree of the curve. So this number is G minus R plus one times G minus D plus R. The exact number there doesn't matter that much, but when rho is greater than or equal to zero, there is a unique component. I'm going to call it the brill noether component. So MGPRD, BN for the brill noether component. In this whole space, and what's special about the real noether component is that it parameterizes non-degenerate maps. So that means I don't map into a smaller space, right? Suppose that you know inside of my r-dimensional space, I have a subspace, which is r minus one dimensional. If my curve mapped into that subspace, I wouldn't really want to consider that as a map to projective space of dimension r because it lives in this r minus one dimensional projective space. So I'm going to make it non-degenerate. It must span the entire space. And the key thing is that this is a general curve of genus G. So like we had generic points that we were trying to interpolate these curves through, now this is going to be, there's nothing special about this genus G curve. It's general in its parameter space. So when rho is greater than equal to zero, there is such a component. And when rho is negative, conversely, no such component exists. 
So this really tells us when we can expect general curves of genus G to live in our dimensional space as a degree D curve. So we'll call these curves in our dimensional space corresponding to points in this component, we'll call them brill noether curves for the brill noether theorem. And the beautiful thing that comes out of the brill noether theorem is a, a calculation of the dimension of this component, which as you will remember, we really wanted because that goes into our expectation. We're gonna divide that by R minus one to figure out the number of general points. So the dimension is R plus one D minus R minus three G minus one. So if we just immediately take that and put it into our, uh, into our expectation, we get a conjecture, the sort of naive conjecture that any, uh, you know, 19th century uh, algebraic geometer would make. So a brill noether curve of degree D and genus G in PR, all of those words I said so far are the type of the curve, interpolates through N general points, if and only if this number N is at most the dimension of my parameter space, which came from the brill noether theorem, R plus one D minus R minus three G minus one over R minus one. Okay, so this is the this is the naive expectation, the sort of naive conjecture, the first conjecture you would make. Any questions about that? Okay, so I want to illustrate one special case of this conjecture, which is when R is three. So remember R was the dimension of the space that we're working in. So if R is three, we're working in three dimensional space, what you would really think of as a space curve, curves in space. So that's nice because when R is three, this R minus three term drops out and it just becomes four D over two, namely two D. So a curve, a brown other curve of degree D in R dimensional space should pass through at most twice the degree number of points. That is this N at most two D. That's what the conjecture predicts. So let's do an example. Here are just some very well-chosen values of D and G and R. So R is three and I'll take D to be six and G to be four. So remember the conjecture predicts it should pass through twice the degree number of general points. So 12 general points. Um, but something that you can, uh, you can prove very easily uh, once you, um, you know, for instance, have taken a first class on curves, it's an easy consequence of the riemann roch theorem, is that every such curve lies on a quadric surface. So I take that curve, there's always some degree two equation um, in space that when I take the vanishing, it also contains the curve. It vanishes everywhere along the curve. Okay, so who remembers where quadric surfaces came up before? And they pass through nine points. Yeah, they pass through nine general points. So that's pretty bad because I want these curves to pass through 12 general points, but the quadric surfaces that they lie on only pass through nine general points. So, okay, well, I can't make a curve pass through 12 general points if it would also force the quadric surface to pass through 12 general points, and that can't happen. So these are counterexamples to that very naive conjecture. You expect them to pass through 12 general points, they can only pass through nine general points. And there's a similar counterexample. If I look at degree five curves of genus two in three-dimensional space, they also lie on quadric surfaces. You expect them to pass through twice the degree, which is 10 general points, but they only pass through nine. So maybe that looks kind of bad <laughs> for this whole, you know, we had this natural conjecture that we wrote down. It was the obvious expectation. We use the brill noether theorem to calculate the dimension, and then it just immediately fails. We can just write down these examples and it, and it fails for, for not very sophisticated reason, reasons. So that, that looks kind of bad. Um, and in fact, there are some more counterexamples that you can write down. So maybe I won't go through this too much in depth, but um, so in three-dimensional space, we have these two invariants, degree five, genus two, degree six, genus four, these lie on quadric surfaces, which don't pass through enough general points. So each of these has a friend counterexample in five dimensional space. So these five, two counterexamples have friends, which are seven, two counterexamples in five dimensional space. And the six, four counterexamples have friend 
10 six counter examples. So um, if you know a little bit of algebraic geometry, you'll know why these are their friends in, in five dimensional space. Um, and these are again, obstructed by some surface. So this uh, degree seven genus two curves, well, these are genus two curves. Um, if you've taken a first course on curves, you'll know that every genus two curve is hyperelliptic, which means there's some involution on this curve, some way of joining, of uh, taking pairs of points. So that if I take the quotient by this involution, I get a genus zero curve, P1, the sphere, the Riemann sphere. So I have these, this involution, which gives me pairs of points, and I can join these points by lines. So then this, uh, so as I take all these points, I join their pairs of points, I get these lines. If I take all those lines, it will sweep out some surface that contains the curve, which is called a scroll. And uh, I expect these curves to pass through gen 10 general points, but you can calculate the scrolls only pass through nine general points. So again, a counterexample. And um, this other one, 10, six. So these are canonical curves of genus six and a general canonical curve of genus six is a quadric section of the Del Peso surface of degree five. Don't need to know any more about that, just that they lie on these certain types of surfaces called Del Peso surfaces of degree five. And a Del Peso surface of degree five only passes through 11 general points, even though we expect the curve to pass through 12. So the particulars are not important, but in all of these four cases, there's some surface that contains my curve. And for geometric reasons, it cannot pass through the right number of points because of that surface. But try as you might, you'll try to find more counterexamples and you won't find any more. So, uh, so the optimist's conjecture is, uh, is to say, well, what we expected is true, except in these five counterexamples. So maybe there's no reason to believe this conjecture. I'm calling it conjecture star, um, except that it's optimistically the best thing that could be true. You interpolate through the expected number of points, if and only if, you are not one of these four counterexamples I showed you on the previous slide. So despite this being, you know, just the optimist's conjecture, it is proved in a bunch of cases, or it was proved in a bunch of cases. So previous work on the interpolation problem was proving special cases of this conjecture star, the optimist's conjecture. So it's true uh, when the genus of the curve is zero. These are the most topologically simple and algebraically simple curves, genus zero curves. So uh, this was proved by Sacchiero in 1980 uh, and then reproved uh, by Ron in uh, 2007. Um, it's also pr true for this family of curves called canonical curves. So those two counterexamples that I showed you, six, four in three-dimensional space and 10, six in five-dimensional space, those were canonical curves. This is the general invariance of that family. So in a series of papers from 1989 and 1996, Stevens proved this conjecture for canonical curves. Um, it's also true asymptotically if the degree is large relative to the genus and the dimension of the space. So, um, so non-special curves, this was proved by Atanasov, Larson, and Yang. And uh, so these curves, they're called non-special curves because this is the case when the if, if this means anything to you, when the line bundle that maps these curves, that gives you the map of these curves to projector space is just a general line. Bundle. So there's nothing special about the way that these curves are mapped to projective space. So this is sort of the easy range where there are many more techniques available to you to, um, to understand the problem. So a first testing ground for the conjecture. Um, and then instead of taking asymptotic ranges or particular families, you could fix a dimension of a space you're working in. Like we already did the case of plane curves. Let's move that up and let's do curves in three-dimensional space, space curves. So many people had worked on this problem. So uh, I'm just highlighting a few. Partial results were given by Ellingsgrad Hershowitz in 1984, Atanasoff in his thesis in 2015, and then I finished this in 2018. So we know the conjecture star is true in three-dimensional space. And it's also true in four-dimensional space. Eric Larson and I did that in, uh, well, the paper appeared in print in 2021. So, okay, so the optimist conjecture, it's true in these cases, but these were all sort of the first cases you would try 
It's not, it's, it's very far away from the full picture of all the possible invariants. Um, and this is where, uh, where progress on the interpolation problem in the modern era um, was up until the beginning of this year. So in the beginning of this year, Eric Larson and I proved this conjecture in full generality. So conjecture star, the optimist conjecture, there's a good reason for being optimistic, it's true. It's true. So a Brill-Nother curve of degree D and genus G in R dimensional space interpolates through the expected number of general points, this naive dimension count, if and only if these invariants D, G, and R are not one of these four counterexamples that are obstructed by surfaces. All right, so uh, let me see, let me pause there and ask if there are any other uh, questions about this, um, this result. And then in maybe my last five minutes, I'll give you one idea of the flavor of thing that goes into proving this. No, okay. So, um, all right, so I want to, I want to outline in, in one specific case, the approach to this conjecture, to, to the conjecture to, that ends up uh, proving this theorem. So we're going to, if you'll humor me, we'll give one more proof of Pappas's theorem that through five general points, there's a plane conic. But this is a proof that will generalize to other cases. So we're going to do something that might originally, might naively seem very, very silly and unhelpful. We're going to start with a degenerate kind of conic. So, so it will be the union of two lines. Think about the union of the xy axes in, in our uh, xy plane. So this is specified by a degree two equation. X times Y equals zero is degree two. It's very non-generic. It's very degenerate. It's not smooth. There's this singular point right here. Um, and because it's not generic, it doesn't pass through a general collection of five points. Any five points that lie on the union of the two axes have to contain three collinear points. I just, by the pigeonhole principle, I have to put three points on one of these components. So this is not a general collection of points. So this might look very silly. But what I can do is I can, I can sort of bump these points into general position. So the grayed out points, those were the original collection of points. But now I'm going to imagine just bumping each of these points in a random direction. And because I made them random, that resulting collection, which are now pink points, those will be generic points. They will be in general position. And now I ask, so I bumped these points, they no longer lie on my degenerate conic. Um, can I sort of bump the conic along too, deform the conic so that it still passes through those points? That's my goal. Bump the points to be general. Can I deform the conic along with them, the degenerate conic? So uh, here's that question just up again at the top. Can I deform the degenerate conic x, y equals zero as I deform the points? So what would it mean to deform this degenerate conic? So I had this equation x, y equals zero. So I'm going to add to it a really small multiple of another quadratic equation. I'll call that q of x, y. And the deformation is going to correspond to what this actual quadratic equation q of x, y is. And I'm going to do this algebraically. So I want to add a really small multiple, I'm calling it epsilon. You know, that's, that's a number we should think of as really small. But I want it to be so small that I'm going to formally declare that its square is 0. So you know, so small that its square is so small, I just don't care about it at all. So the question is, can I choose this q of x, y so that when I add in epsilon times q of x, y, it will pass through these new pink points? Um, okay, so let's just do an example. So let's imagine that this grayed out original point was at a comma zero on the x axis, and that I've bumped it in this in this general direction, which is very small. So I'm going to use epsilons. So I've bumped it um, alpha epsilon, beta epsilon. So the new point is a plus alpha epsilon and beta epsilon. So if I want my deformed conic to pass through this deformed point, I just need to plug in a plus alpha epsilon for x and beta epsilon for y and see if I get something that's zero. 
So if I plug that into my equation right here, things will simplify a lot because epsilon squared is zero. That's why this is nice. And what you will see is that that thing is zero if and only if Q of A comma zero takes the specified value minus A beta. So the actual value is not important. All that's important is that in order for my deformed conic to pass through this deformed point, I need my uh, parameter that I'm using to deform, this Q, to take a specified value at my original point. So why can I find, so now I want to convince you that I can in fact find a deformed conic through these deformed points. So there's three points on this line at which I need my quadratic polynomial to take a specified value. And warring interpolation tells us I can find a degree two polynomial in X that takes specified value at three points. That's one more than the degree. So great, I figured out what Q of X comma zero should be. So now let's look at the Y axis. There's two points at which I need to take it, it to take specified value, these two grayed out points. But in order to agree with what I had on the X axis, I also needed to take a specified value where they meet at the origin. So that bumps it up to a third uh, general point. So now there is a unique Q of zero Y and they have the same constant term. So I can use them to get together to get a polynomial of degree two in X and Y. So that's just what I said. Warring interpolation tells us that we can take, we can find Q of X zero and Q of zero Y with the same constant term, and that will give us uh, the deformation. So here, if you carry out that procedure with, with the points I just gave you, you will get this deformed um, conic, which will look like this hyperbola um, that actually passes through those points. So the idea in general that we use to prove this theorem is we write down degenerate curves that look like this, unions of lines and smaller degree curves, and then we deform the points, and we show that you can deform the curve along with it. All right, so I will stop there and um, ask for questions and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Isabel. Maybe I'll clap for everybody. Um, are there any questions? I, I have one. So in your proof, where does the special cases, the counter examples come in? Right, so it's very easy. Avoid. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy to prove they are counterexamples. The hard thing is to prove that they're the only counterexamples. So the proof is by induction. This idea of breaking your curve is very well positioned for induction because if you can break it into smaller curves and you know that the thing works for those smaller curves, then you can build them up by induction. But we have a bunch of real, like we have, we have relatively complicated, several, many relatively complicated induction procedures because you can never reduce to a base case, which is one of these four counterexamples. That would be really bad. So it has to be, we have like a number of, of complicated inductive arguments that will always reduce you to a case which is not one of these counterexamples. So, so the fact that they are there makes it a much harder theorem to prove. Yeah, that was a really good question. Thank you. Other questions? Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, I, I know you you're you're only doing exact um, interpolation, but I'm tempted to ask: uh, Are there, for example, if you are doing if one does linear numerical linear algebra, if you're trying to fit a cloud of points with with uh, linear uh, expressions, you you can look at the singular values, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the are there analogs of 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 this in for um, higher dimensional algebraic curves? Uh, do people work on it? I'm curious. It's very much out of my wheelhouse. I wouldn't know. I would. I mean, I'm, I imagine yes. Uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, the techniques Sorry, must I, be different. Yeah, I, I can. Imagine. I'm sure very, very different. Yeah. 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 Good question, but not my, uh, not my area of expertise. Any other questions? 
If not, let's thank Isabel for a great talk. And let me clap for everybody so that there's some noise. So. Um, let me see. Recording.